Greetings, Farm Dave here with another presentation on behalf of Healthy But Whole. Today we're going to be talking about perioperative management of anticoagulation. The outline of our discussion is we're going to look at definitions, etiology, the coagulation cascade, recommendations per anticoagulant, and some summary slides. So the definitions, um, therapeutic anticoagulation is given to patients who are at a higher thrombus risk given their underlying health status. This list is not all encompassing, but these are some of the most common patients you'll see. Those with AFib, those with cancers with a high embolic risk, cardiac disease, and those with an existing recurrent thrombus or VTE, and those with coagulopathy. The treatment guidelines are per chest. Um, I also reference some relevant trials and literature. Um, other uses of anticoagulation include VTE prophylaxis, and this is through the 2018 American Society of Hematology guidelines. Do note we're talking about therapeutic anticoagulation management, not the management of VTE prophylaxis. Anticoagulant medications include DOAC, so apixaban, rivaroxaban, and dabigatran. Um, also warfarin, unfractionated heparin, which I abbreviate UFH, and low molecular weight heparin, L. MWH, or which is just the same as anoxaparin, and when I refer to the perioperative window, it is one week before an operation up to four weeks after. Looking at anticoagulation in America, there's a significant population that we're talking about. Um, looking at specific estimates within America, AFib is estimated to occur in 12.1 million patients by 2030. Valvular heart disease is present in more than 8 million current Americans. All throm thromboembolic events occur in 1 to 3 per 1,000 people, and tons of people get cancer every year, so big patient population. Um, within federal systems alone, in 2018, there was more than 8 million Americans on therapeutic anticoagulation. Um, the final etiological point is that DOAC's usage has increased substantially over the last decade. Um, specifically looking in AFib, we see a tenfold increase use and a representative decrease and warfarin. Um, the coagulation cascade is kind of looking at the hemostasis, so the balance of fibrinolysis and coagulability, so that coagulability side. The intrinsic coagulation pathway is considered spontaneous and is always happening, whereas the extrinsic pathway is uh, something that occurs in response to epithelial insult. The factors of target for pharmaceuticals is factor X, which is thrombokinase, uh, factor XA, which just means activated factor X, which is the prothrombin activator, factor 2, which is prothrombin, 2A, thrombin, and factor 13, which is the fibrin stabilizing factor. Um, there's a nice image here from osmosis if you want to really picture how we're getting from the insole or the intrinsic pathway down to a big fibrin clot. Um, this figure that I took off of Wikipedia from Mr. Steve Kong himself just shows where these different anticoagulants act. You see warfarin hits multiple, heparin hits two, and then these DOACs, our factor XA or our direct thrombin, only hit a single agent. Um, when we're talking about anticoagulation today, I do reference an anticoagulation timeline. So coming into the hospital and leaving, um, the intervention happens somewhere in the middle. Um, prior to the intervention, for most anticoagulants, you're going to need to interrupt that anticoagulant. After the intervention, you will resume said anticoagulant and in between, for very certain patients, you may do bridging. Um, in between, there's also the option for VTE prophylaxis. Again, this is not what we're talking about really in this presentation, but VTE prophylaxis is just for standard patients or maybe those at a higher risk for blood clots um, and is more of a a pan-administered preventative care, especially in hospitalized patients. So when we're starting this timeline, what we're going to look at is how to interrupt a patient. Um, so the first thing you would consider is who is your patient? What is their bleed risk and what is their thromboembolic risk? So patients who are at a moderate bleed risk, you really need to monitor anticoagulation closely. Those are patients of advanced age or the elderly, those with reduced renal or hepatic functions, those with hypertension, alcohol use disorders, INRs in their labs greater than three, um, LFTs greater than three times up 
upper normal limit, and of course, those who are taking anticoagulants. A high bleed risk, unlike a moderate bleed risk, may actually limit the use of an anticoagulant. So if you ever have a patient on these with any of these factors, you may worry about starting anticoagulation on them. That is those who had had a recent trauma within one month, major bleeds, GI bleeds that are recurrent or within one year, GI ulcers, uncontrolled hypertension, bleeding disorders, certain cancers, anemia, thrombocytopenia, major surgery within one month, chronic NSAIDs, or thromboembolics within two days or 48 hours. A high thromboembolic risk is on the opposite side of the bleed risk. This limits anticoagulation interruption. These are patients with a past medical history of thromboembolism within three months or just recurrent thromboembolism, coagulopathy, certain cancers, AFib with a chads vask score greater than seven, mechanical heart valves, the MVR greater than the AVR, so that mitral valve is really the higher risk one, um, prior stroke or transient ischemic attacks within three months, or severe thrombophilia. Um, some people will include a recent PCI, which is a percutaneous coronary intervention or as most people call them a stent or a prior thromboembolism during the interruption of anticoagulation. Note, these are risks based on literature and trials, and clinical judgment will always take precedence. Um, here I also did summarize procedural bleed risks per the 2022 CHESS guidelines. If you're not sure if your procedure is high, low, or minimal bleed risks, look through this. Um, generally, if you're doing anything breaking the surface of the skin significantly, you're beyond a minical, minimal bleed risk, and you're going to worry about the anticoagulant. Um, the first thing I'm going to address in this uh, anticoagulation timeline is bridging. So this is from the moment of interruption up to surgery, sometimes after. And what bridging is, is the interruption of a long acting anticoagulant with interim coverage of a shorter acting agent. It is considered only in those who are at a high arterial thrombus risk. So that was the slide way back when, slide uh, ooh, nope, not that far. This slide. Um, so these patients with a high thromboembolic risk um, where stopping their anticoagulant is basically not feasible based on how likely they are to have increased morbidity by that interruption. Um, I created a new slide. Um, the bridging product choice is typically if a patient is at an excessively high risk for thromboembolism we are going to prefer anoxaparin over heparin this is because it's a better anticoagulant with stronger effects um, whereas with those in renal impairment a need for future interventions or high bleed risk we prefer the opposite heparin because of its shorter half-life bridging doses are per patient indication so patients who have an arterial embolic risk being AFib with a high chides vask score or mechanical heart valves, remember that mitral valve, recent thromboembolism within one month or significant concern for thromboembolism risk, you're going to go with anoxaparin one mg per kg twice a day or a heparin drip per facility protocol. Um, you could even do 1.5 mg per kg per day for the hep uh, anoxaparin, just to throw that out there. Um, and prophylactic dosing may be appropriate for patients beyond these ones. So that's your anoxaparin 40 milligrams daily or 30 milligrams twice a day or heparin 5,000 units three times a day. I want to stress that bridging is not indicated for most patients. If you look through the most recent chest guidelines, nearly every instance we're going to see that we prefer not to bridge rather than to bridge in most patients. Um, rather than going through all these summaries, I'm just going to tell you it's only in patients who are on warfarin who are at an excessively high risk for thrombosis. Embolism. It is not DOAX, and also bridging is not the same thing as DVT prophylaxis. Looking at our first anticoagulant that we're going to talk about how to stop, um, the DOAX. So Apixaban, which the brand name is Eliquis, Rivaroxaban, which is Xarelto, and Dabigatran, which is Pradoxa. Um, the Apixaban and Rivaroxaban are direct factor 10A inhibitors, whereas Dabigatran is a direct thrombin, or 2A, inhibitor. Discontinuation is made based on the patient's renal function inpatient. Outpatient practitioners often follow a pause approach, which in low to moderate bleed risks, they hold the anticoagulant for one day pre-op and resume after one day. In a high bleed risk or impaired renal function, they increase it to two days. 
inpatient, we're a little bit more liable and a little bit more careful. So what we worry about is a patient's creatinine clearance, which reflects their renal function. I'm not going to go through and summarize how we do it for all low-risk procedures versus high-risk procedures. If you're studying for an exam, this is probably much too deep. But if you do need to look through here and be like, oh, I'm doing a low-risk procedure, dabigatran, their creatinine clearance is 30, you can figure it out. Um, the consult pharmacy is because when patients get this low, if it is a permanent decline in their renal function, i.e. not just an acute kidney injury, you're likely to have to reconsider the use of a DOAC altogether. Um, if it is an acute kidney injury, you can wait until they recover. For resuming a DOAC, if it's a low to moderate bleed risk procedure, you wait one day. High risk, you wait at least two days. Do note that there are other limiting factors stopping the initiation of a DOAC. You need to know that there's no need for further invasive interventions. Do they need to go back to the OR? And is the patient hemodynamic? hemodynamically stable. You can't put a patient back on a DOAC if they're actively bleeding. Reversal agents, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because that could be a whole lecture in itself. Just know if somebody is acutely bleeding, you're going to go for these Pokemon sounding ones. Or if there's just an urgent need to recoagulate for an operation, you'll probably go with fresh frozen plasma. That's not necessarily based on the data, that's more of based on a protocol per facility, you're not going to see these just thrown around willy-nilly to get somebody in the OR. This is for acute bleeds. Um, looking at warfarin, the mechanism of action is a vitamin K antagonist that inhibits the downstream factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Um, and with warfarin, the primary thing is holding until your INR normalizes, which would be considered less than 1.5. If there is an urgent procedure, you might need to consult the pharmacy for the need to reverse the warfarin effects. However, in elective procedures or less than urgent procedures, you're just going to hold the medication until that INR normalizes, which which most often takes five days. Again, this is that period when you're holding the warfarin that you may be using bridging for patients who are at that high thromboembolic risk. Restarting warfarin is 12 to 24 hours postoperatively, and for those, again, at the th high thromboembolic risk, you may need to bridge um, until the INR is back to therapeutic. Um, depending on how worried you are, you'll either go with therapeutic anticoagulation or DVT prophylaxis. The literature will say therapeutic anticoagulation, whereas in practice, it's more often the DVT prophylaxis. Something to note is in low-risk surgeries where it's one day in and then you're out, it is appropriate to discharge a patient if you feel that the intervention was successful and there's a low bleeding risk to discharge on their home dosing and follow-up in clinic. The reversal of warfarin is vitamin K with or without that fresh frozen plasma plasma. Do note that the perioperative use of vitamin K does make it hard to get a patient back on therapeutic warfarin, where the target INR is at least 2, more often 2.5. The last anticoagulants we've referenced a handful of times is our low molecular weight heparin and oxaparin and heparin itself. So holding low molecular weight heparin, the enoxaparin, it's based on the dosing. And these are the anticoagulant doses. This is not the DVT prophylaxis doses, which are down here. Um, the anticoagulant doses, if they're on a MIG per kg twice a day, hold for 24 hours before the operation. If they're at the higher dose, 1.5 MIGs per kg per day, hold for 24 to 36. Um, restarting the low molecular weight heparin once they are hemodynamically stable. Um, in a low bleed risk procedure, you can start at 24 hours, higher, wait at least 48. Um, for heparin, this is why when I was saying if we're going back into the OR, you only have to hold it for 4 hours. Um, preferably, you do sometimes wait up to 12, especially in those higher risk procedures, but the guidelines will give you that 4 hour window in case you need to get in there fast. Restarting heparin, if it's a low risk risk procedure they're coming out of, 12 hours is appropriate. High risk, you might lean towards 48. This is the VTE prophylaxis dosing if needed perioperatively. So these little uh, pokes that we have throughout here. Um, these are not stopped or restarted at the same scale that we see above. They're generally shorter. 
Um, rather than going back through and summarizing everything I've talked about, you can use this to kind of wrap your mind around everything we talked about. So all of the different medication classes of therapeutic anticoagulants for the DOAX, the renal considerations, and those pre-op low-risk hold criteria versus high-risk hold criteria. The post-op low-risk versus the post-op high risk. This is just a summary slide again. I'm not going to go through and read it all once more, but feel free to use this in your notes. And here are my references. Thank you.